public interest. I am Malika Ramsey. Thanks for joining us this week. On the 6th of July 1964, about 40 men, women and children were killed, uh, of course, by a bomb on the Sun Chapman uh, vessel. Now, of course, we quickly approach the anniversary for that um, tragic event, and Mr. Grincher will definitely talk to you this week about, you know, some of the things that would have led up to that, and if we've actually reconciled since that bombing. And of course, on that note, I introduce to you leader of the People's National Congress Reform and leader of the opposition, Brigadier the Honorable David Grincher. Welcome back, sir. Thank you, Malika. Let's jump right into it, sir. Do you believe that? Guyana has, of course, it's not only about Linden. Has Guyana reconciled from that horrific tragedy in 1964? Well, I would hope that most people have um, forgiven. Um, they might not have forgotten, but I hope that reconciliation process has started. Uh, it is uh, an event which took place in a very difficult period of our history. And unfortunately, the period is clouded um, by uh, racism, uh, which has been disappeared completely, and by lots of terrorist events. Uh, and unfortunately at that time many persons um, were being sent overseas for uh, terrorist training, you can't call it military training, terrorist training by the People's Progressive Party. And uh, I think the inflow of weapons at that time and the training of persons from the Progressive Youth Organization uh, helped to you know, aggravate the political uh, problems we were having at that time, particularly between 1962 and 1964. So I think the Sun Chapman tragedy um, was really the, the worst event in that period, which we call the disturbances. You did say that racism has not completely disappeared from society. Do you believe that Guyana is in any danger of Go, it, it's, it will be taking a step back or steps back to that uh, kind of society that we had where you know people were just, uh, at least in that period, just really, really violent toward each other. It is in recognition of the fact that there is still racism that a PNU, a Partnership for National Unity, was established uh, two years ago because uh, by its very title, mm -hmm. um, a Partnership for National Unity intends to promote national unity. It is a fact, it is a historical fact that um, political parties have tended to uh, be supported by particular ethnic groups. At one time, the United Force um, in the 1960s, when it was first established, was heavily supported by the then Portuguese uh, and indigenous population, because, partly because of the influence of the Roman Catholic Church. And the leader, of course, was Portuguese, Peter de Guerra, and he was a Roman Catholic, he was a businessman. So he did attract followers from that group. Similarly, uh, Forbes Burnham was African Guyanese, and many of his followers in the People's National Congress were Af of African descent. And Chedi Jagan was Indian, and many of his followers were Indian. So we had a situation in the 1960s in which the three major parties uh, mobilized support largely along ethnic lines. Mm -hmm. um, so when political rivalry uh, was transformed into the, the sort of uh, rivalry for, you know, to see who would be the government, who would form the government after independence, it had a racial flavor. And when terrorism was introduced by the People's Progressive Party, that terrorism, of course, took a political and therefore racial flavor. So I would say that um, things were bad then, but we have not really been able to escape from the scourge of racism, and that is why APNU was formed, to create a new type of party that um, turns away from mobilizing constituents uh, along racial lines. And I think we've been largely successful. For example, right now, in the National Assembly, APNU has five parties, and the Guyan Action Parties, largely uh, Amerindian and the Justice Royal Party is led by um, Indians and the Working People's Alliance, um, the People's National Congress and the National Front Alliance. So the five parties together have started to break down the walls of racism. So I would say that uh, we are not um, at the desirable level of uh, reconciliation or national unity, but we're working to get there and APNU is certainly in the lead.
in terms of building um, the first really uh, multi-ethnic party in Guyana. I'm going to come back to the reconciliation part of it um, uh, in a bit, but before I do that, are you not concerned, uh, of course, with saying that uh, the PPP introduced um, terrorism? And probably in asking you that question, I should really ask you, why, without having you go back into a long history, why was the Sun Chapman vessel bombed? Um, well, <laughs> it's difficult to be short about that. Okay. Uh, to start with, the period leading up to independence was one of intense political rivalry. Both uh, Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica won their independence in 1962. And uh, Guyana was regarded as one of the more advanced countries at, this, at that time. And uh, there are some people in Guyana who wanted independence. Forbes Burnham said clearly that uh, regardless of who won the 1961 election, you know, whether it's he won it or Jagan, he would be on the plane next day to go to Britain to demand independence. He was really um, a veteran fighter for, for independence. But there was rivalry in the trade unions, there was rivalry in the political organization, there was rivalry in ethnic organizations as well. Um, and the Sun Chapman event arose because of the importation, I would say, of terrorism and of weapons into the country by the People's Progressive Party. I have no apologies for saying that because it is well known that the Progressive Youth Organization been sending students to Cuba to be trained by the hundred, <laughs> by the hundred. Um, and at that time, Cuba was a, well, it is still a communist state. Cuba was committed to uh, having the revolution in South America just as they had in, in, um, in East Asia, in places like Vietnam, in Southeast Asia. And of course, later on, as you know, Che Guevara actually went to Bolivia. But they regarded Guyana, and Chedi Jagan and Janet Jagan visited Cuba um, on, on several occasions in the 1960, 1960s. And um, weapons were brought into this country. At that time, Cuba was converting from the American weapons, which they used during the previous regime under um, General Batista, and they were converting to um, Soviet weapons. So they had a lot of excess American weapons, and some of those weapons turned up in Guyana. So we had weapons and people who were trained in making bombs and sabotage and murder. And uh, it was no war of liberation, it's just a, it's just a terrorism, a war of terrorism that was implanted in this country. No, the trade unions, adopted, I would say, the complexion of the political parties. And up to now, as you know, the Guyana Agriculture and General Workers Union is still largely a PPP party. It goes to PPP Congress, and its members are largely people from the sugar industry. And the majority of members come from one eth ethnic group. And similarly, the PNC has uh, unions affiliated to it. And, um, well, the United Force is no longer a major political uh, force in Guyana. But uh, in 1964, what happened is that Chedi Jagu was very angry at the imposition of proportional representation by the British government. Although he agreed to um, accept the, the dictates of the British government, when the British government actually imposed proportional representation, he came back to Guyana and declared something called a hurricane of protest. And as part of that hurricane of protest, um, the Guyana Agriculture and General Workers Union College strike in the sugar industry. And they started to attract, uh, sorry, they started to attack um, the strike breakers, many of whom, some were Indian, many were African. And this gave it uh, a racial complexion. So around from February in 1964, um, the PPP had embarked on a campaign of terror and there were a lot of murders committed um, during that period. There was a bad case on Losing Nan on the East Coast, in which, um, as you know, the sugar planters and the, the managers, their, family, their children would come to town in a bus, you know, to go to school, and then every day they'd go back to the estates in a bus. And the Gao terrorists threw a bomb into the bus and killed a boy, a young 14-year-old boy called Godfrey Teixeira. I remember that incident very well, Godfrey Teixeira. Um, and then 
the actual first murder in that time was a chap called Edgar Monroe, which uh, took place at Tain while uh, a sugar a Guyana. Uh, at that time, the sugar estates were owned by Booker Sugar Company, Booker's company, Booker Estate. And the truck was taking workers into the uh, Port Morant plantation, Port Morant Estate, and a bomb was thrown by Gawu terrorists into the bus, into the truck, and um, Edgar Monroe and uh, another person called Gun, uh, Monroe, uh, Gunraj, mm. Monroe and Gunraj were killed. Um, so what happened to bring about the Sun Chapman is that there was this uh, constant terrorism, murder, arson. Every night you'd look in the skies and you'd see um, the skies were glowing red because um, the PYO and the Gawu terrorists were burning the cane fields. And um, this went on until in uh, around May, March, April, May, um, we had a very bad scene in which um, um, two old people, two old farmers in, uh, in Buxton village, uh, they were called Sealy, um, and they went to the farm at the back of the, of the village and uh, to reap the crops to sell at the market. And they were murdered and the bodies were badly mutilated. But when the bodies were brought out, um, there was a, a, a very angry response on the part of the villagers. And many uh, of the villagers had relatives in, in uh, Wisma and Mackenzie and there were some atrocities at Wisma um, in which uh, many of the Indian families, businesses and so on were burned and two, two people, three people were, were killed. Mm. Um, so that was the Wisma, I think that took place around the, between the 25th and 26th or, of, of May. And there were other atrocities, for example, there was a Roman Catholic, a Portuguese Roman Catholic family in Hatfield Street, literally a stone's throw from the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception, and about eight members of the family were, were burnt to death there, and uh, by a, a bomb, which was uh, what uh, it was then called a channel bomb. You know, the, 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 the channel be soaked in, in gasoline, and then when it's lit and it's thrown, and it burst, so the channel run mm. all over the building. So. A large areas engulfed at the same time, and a family was incinerated. Um, I think only about three members of the family were saved. The mother, who was waiting for her daughter to come on from the from a um, theater girl play, the daughter was actually the theater girl, and I think one child who was was saved, and the rest of the father and everybody else was burnt up. That happened on the 12th of June, and it should be something that you should remark on because the very next morning, the very next morning after that fire, the governor, because the governor was, um, it was then a colony, we were, British Guiana was then a colony, the governor had powers, um, arrested about 32 members of the PPP uh, without charge and under the emergency, there was a state of emergency, under the emergency regulations, they were sent to Mazzoni prison and detained without trial or without charge. Um, and one of those persons was the deputy premier who was a member of the PPP at that time. Uh, but two or three members of the PNC were also arrested, but 32 members of the PPP were arrested uh, on grounds of, of their being involved in terrorist activities. So that, was, well, that happened in June. Now in July, on the 6th of July, um, the Sun Chapman, which was the main launch, taking people and produce between Georgetown and Lynn, and uh, it was not called Linden then, it was called Mackenzie and Wisma. Um, uh, would, because at that time there was no highway. Mm -hmm. And um, most people got to Linden by a boat called RH Car, which was very inadequate, but it was all they had. You know, you couldn't walk through the bush and you couldn't swim. So you had to go with the RH car. But because of the strike, I think the RH car stopped work running because there were many threats to bomb the RH car. And um, this vessel called the Sun Chapman was basically a wooden launch. It was owned by Mr. Norman Chapman, and that's why it was called Sun Chapman, S-O-N, the son of Chapman. And um, 
it loaded up with produce and I think maybe about four dozen or more people in Georgetown. And they were going along to Mackenzie. It was a very slow trip. I think it, those days would probably take about eight hours. <laughs> and it, it uh, stopped at a place called Herdaya. Um, it's just a small settlement there, but when it uh, attempted to leave, this huge explosion, people were blown in the air. Um, bits of the human flesh were floating around. Um, there was blood. If you read the testimony of the survivors, you know, they were trying to swim to the bank, but there was blood and flesh all around. And it was really terrible because people were literally blown to pieces. And of course, they, for days afterwards, the water was rank. And then, of course, people trying to trace their families, and they were just an arm here, a leg here. The, the one woman, I think, was pregnant, and she just the shock just threw the baby out. It was really a, a, a terrible atrocity. I've never heard of anything else happening like that in Guyana. Um, that 6th of July, 1964. So the Sun Chapman was an incident um, which it was so brutal, it was so vicious that I think people felt that this was the limit. And a few days afterwards, the PPP, the Guyana Agricultural Workers Union, actually called off the strike in July 1964. What the defining incident in that entire year of, of trouble was the Sun Chapman atrocity. I better you, you use the word reconciliation. Um, I had spoken with, on a previous uh, uh, commemoration event, and I did call for reconciliation. And I do believe that it struck an, uh, a chord in the hearts of the, the, the Lindeners that this event must be used to demonstrate how um, inhumane we could be to one another um, on grounds of uh, either racial differences or political um, differences, you know. Do you believe, and, and this, this probably is going to take you back to an early question that I pose, that uh, this type of violent character still exists or could probably wear its ugly head today coming out, I mean specifically to the PPP because, of course, as you said, you know, they introduced uh, terrorism to Guyana. Do you believe that some of that can still exist? Well, I don't think it's possible under the PPP. The PPP has a long history of terror. Um, if I can go a little further back, 60 years ago in 1953, as you know, this is another anniversary year, this anniversary of the um, the expulsion of the PPP from government. At that time, the PPP, um, I call it the original PPP because um, Forbes Burnham was the chairman. And uh, as you know, there were six ministers. The PPP, although we were still a colony, you can't call it the PPP government, but there were six ministers in what was called the Executive Council. It wasn't even called the Cabinet, it was called the Executive Council. So you had an ex Executive Council, which is called Exco, and you had a Legislative Council, which is called Legco. And um, well, LegCo is now the National Assembly and the Executive Council is now the Cabinet. Well, on, in October 1953, uh, the Constitution was suspended and the British government sent in troops here and they uh, expelled the PPP ministers. Uh, the next year the PPP launched um, uh, what they call a passive resistance campaign. Well, it was very passive because uh, there was a place in George, there were several incidents and people were arrested again without trial by the British, including Martin Carter. Um, but there was a statue in front of the law courts. In fact, in days gone by, he actually was called the Victoria Law Courts. We didn't call it the High Court or the Supreme Court, it's called the Victoria Law Courts. And there's a huge statue of, of, of Queen Victoria. And on her birthday, <laughs> in May 1960, 1954, it was blown up by PPP terrorists. The statue was blown up. And um, some people paid to have it rebuilt, and then it was rebuilt. And when uh, Prime Minister Burnham uh, got into office, we moved it again to the Botanical Gardens. And when the PPP got into office, the PPP brought the statue back. Strangely enough, the people who blew up the statue 
1954, she'll bring it back. Uh, right there, if you look at it carefully, you see the nose is broken, the heart is broken, and so on. Um, because um, in 1994, I think, um, Queen Elizabeth came. Okay, and so they wanted to put the, uh, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother back on the pedestal. But um, I said this to explain that from 1954, the PPP was known to be a terrorist organization because they blew up Queen Victoria statue. And um, as a military officer, I can tell you, you know, in the 1960s, 1970s, they were the ones who were committing the arson, burning uh, sugarcane plantations. Um, and this is what happened in, um, in the so-called disturbances. Now, I do believe that um, it is possible for a real government of national unity to bring about national unity. Okay. But uh, the PPP on its own does not have the will, I don't think it has the interest in bringing about national unity. So I don't have faith that this present government is capable of bringing about uh, rec the sort of reconciliation which this country needs uh, to bring all people together. They're interested in division, they're interested in separating one um, set of person from another set of person. That is, that is responsible for the behavior in, um, in places like Box and Friendship, you know, the way and responsible behavior in Linden up to now. You know, so I don't believe that um, there is within the PPP the will to bring about real reconciliation. Have you ever been exposed to any of the survivors from the Sun Chapman tragedy? No, I as when I was involved in publishing a, a, a periodical, I did meet members of the family who owned the Sun Chapman, but I have not, and I've read accounts by the survivors, but I've not ever met an actual survivor okay. in the over the last four or nine years. But I've read much of the reports, the testimonies that they they gave to the newspapers um, at the time or soon soon after the incident in July 1964 and since then. Have you, or, or I should say, do you, do you believe that they would have gotten justice somehow or the other, you know, got some sense of peace or as we say, some sense of closure even after that tragedy? The, the relatives of uh, those persons who would have, uh, who were killed during that period, even the, the, the survivors? No, um, there was no solace given to the survivors. Um, in fact, when the Wismer atrocity occurred in May, the PPP mobilized all the government resources, the Ministry of Works, you know, they provided boats, they provided housing and all sorts of um, relief for the survivors of that tragedy. But I am not aware that the PPP lifted a finger to help the survivors of the San Chapman tragedy. In fact, the People's National Congress uh, went up and helped with the funerals and uh, because it was so massive. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say this for the PNC, they never attempted to exploit the, the feelings of the aggrieved relatives for political purposes. In fact, um, many people were baffled that um, you know, people were encouraged not to seek revenge by the PNC. Uh, the next year, uh, a coroner's inquest was conducted. In those days, we had coroner's inquest, not like nowadays. Now with the PPP, you have a minister of the government being assassinated and there's no inquest. These people don't have respect for institutions, you know. But in 1965, there was a coroner's inquest, but it was impossible to determine who placed the bomb on the boat. And um, although evidence was presented about the, you know, by the survivors, Nobody was ever convicted for that um, horrible crime. Okay. Well, it's now Lyndon. I, I know you did explain that then it was Wismer and Mackenzie. And, and this, uh, unfortunately, this brings to mind uh, what happened in 2012 of uh, July. I think that was on, on, on July the 18th. Can you relate the two, the two incidences in any way? I mean, of course, we know, um, I, forgive me for saying only, but only uh, four persons, th three persons, uh, four persons, I think, died last year as against over 40 who were killed. Well, the incidents it, are certainly different. Mm. There is a linkage, however, in the, in the mentality of the PPP, mm. in the mindset of the PPP, 
in the way they dealt with that community. Uh, I do not believe that there is a parallel in other communities. I'm aware that during the, the PPP's tenure of office, particularly during the last 10 years, there have been disturbances in several places on the quarantine um, and on the East Emra and West Coast Babies. Um, there are photographs which have been published in the press of, of farmers in Blackbush Pool burning tires, blocking roads. And there's a very bad case when uh, Ronald Gadred was the Minister of, of um, Home Affairs. Um, there were several protests in, in the central quarantine and an attempt was made to burn down the Albion police station. Uh, um, uh, magistrate's motor car was overturned and burnt. Um, but the, the government, the PPP government, never used the same measures to suppress the disorders there as they used in, in Linden. Um, I think definitely the, the suppression of the, well, I can't call it suppression. The attitude towards the crowd, because it was not even unruly, it was not even a mob, but the attitude to the um, people in Linden was, was completely different. It was uh, unprovoked and it was disproportionate use of force. And it is quite a pity that the, the honorable members of that commission of inquiry, although they knew and they stated clearly that the police were responsible, did not clearly allocate blameworthiness and uh, calling the government to pay a higher rate of compensation. So there is a link, mm. because the, the PPP mindset is such that the people of London uh, receive different treatment at the hands of the Ghana police force directed by, uh, well, under the general direction of the Ministry of Home Affairs, the Minister of Home Affairs at that time, Mr. Ro uh, Rohi. But the treatment was different from what occurred in different pla other places in the country where there were disturbances of the peace. Finally, sir, David Granger, what would David Granger like to say to probably not only the PPP but Guyanese as a whole regarding uh, reconciliation as we observe another uh, anniversary of the Sun Chapman tragedy? Well, it is a time to take stock. It is a time to reach out. It is a time to remember. Um, how close to the edge we came because of political and racial differences. It's a time to come back from, to step back from the precipice and for Guyanese to go to church, <laughs> um, seek solace in the religious uh, beliefs, the, re the various religious faith. And let us study the principles of the persons who, who uh, practice those faiths, Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, and the other faiths. Um, to desist from violence. I don't know of any religion in Ghana which preaches violence, which preaches revenge. And we have to be very careful that we don't allow this particular PPP government to take us to the edge again. So on this occasion, it, although it's a time for remembrance, it's also a time for resolve that we must pass a resolution that we must not allow ourselves to be divided now again, just as we were divided at that time. I think the PPP did a lot of damage in 1964, 49 years ago, and you must not allow them to repeat that divisionism which they practiced at that time. So that is my message. It's a message of reconciliation, but it's also a message of understanding. It's a message of forgiveness, but it's also a message of looking to the future and ensuring that there's no uh, repetition of such madness. Thank you very much, sir. This has been another program of the public interest. I am Alec Ramsey. Thank you very much for joining us. Until next time, goodbye.